Hi, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs. Lecture number one, Knowledge Representation with Graphs. In this section of the lecture we are going to talk about Knowledge Graphs. Okay, let's have a look at the following diagram. We know this already. We can, of course, transport knowledge in way of graphs. And this is an intuitive way of knowledge representation, as we have said. Based on the graph that we have already introduced in the last lecture, what we did here is simply we extended the graph a little bit. So besides Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock in Star Trek, we also have introduced here Alec Guinness on the other side, who was playing Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. So, based on that example, if I show you now the following, could you guess the meaning too? And this exactly is the situation that the machine is in. So the machine does not necessarily know who is Leonard Nimoy. The machine does not know that both of these things refer to science fiction. The machine sees somehow character strings like you see here, but without any idea what the character strings really mean. And therefore it only sees the structure that you have here and also can see that there are structural similarities. For example, that we might have here edges with the same kind of label for both of these structures on both sides. But of course we can't tell anything about its meaning. So how does this work in the traditional solution? In the traditional solution, the human, usually the programmer, reads and understands the labels. What is happening then is that the programmer encodes the meaning, as far as she understood it, into the software, by hand, hard-coded. Thereby the software then can interpret the data that it finds and the graphs correctly. That's the tradi traditional solution. However, we have to be careful. Pantare, everything flows, as Heraclitus, a famous philosopher in the 6th century BCE, has said. So things might be subject to change. What if new navels are introduced? So Spock, of course, has a home planet, Vulcan. We have to introduce it here. It's not represented in our software that we have, of course, written beforehand. And on the other hand, if a label is changing, so if we change plate into character plate, then of course the software who was referring to exactly the label plate would not work anymore and we would have to adapt it. So you see there is much effort in adaption and synchronization involved in the traditional solution. Thereby we have to distinguish between implicit and explicit knowledge representation. So here in our graph usually the semantics is given implicitly encoded via natural language. Prerequisites for the interoperability so that we can use it in different scenarios is of course that people prepare natural language definitions for all of the terms that we have used here. So that means we need a terminology or a glossary that explains the things we are talking about. And of course everybody has to agree to apply those terminologies and glossaries. So we have to have some kind of a metadata standardization. That's one of the prerequisites. And then, of course, we have to guarantee that everybody interprets natural language uniquely and in the same way, because otherwise we are busted and interoperability is not possible anymore. For that, let's introduce something which we call knowledge graphs. And we introduce it first on a rather shallow and general level. What is a knowledge graph? A knowledge graph mainly describes real-world entities and their interrelations. And of course this is organized in a graph as we have already seen it. It defines possible classes and relations of entities in a kind of schema. And in the schema information there also we have to put in explicit knowledge representations. It allows for potentially interrelating arbitrary entities with each other and covers potentially various topical domains. That's a knowledge graph. And this is what we are talking about in the entire lecture. But we will refine this, of course, and we will put more semantics into it, more formal semantics, as you will see. So let's go back to our graph that we have here and let's think of, of course, how this definition really fits to our graph. Of course, 
mainly describes real-world entities and the interrelations organized in the graph that fits. And the second thing that fits here also is number three, allows for potentially interrelating arbitrary entities with each other. So we could, for example, also here connect Leonard Nimoy directly to science fiction with the property that we could name, for example, plate in genre. And in that way, you could, of course, arbitrarily put each of the nodes that are somehow here interconnected via a path directly with each other. And of course, next thing, number four, covers various topical domains. So this one here covers, as we see here, science fiction, of course. And of course, we can do other kind of graphs. And the third one is defines, or the last one, defines possible classes and relations of entities in a schema. For that, of course, we would have to extend the graph to make clear what is Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's a fictional character and a fictional character is a subclass of something which we might refer to as an agent. As well as Anaginis is a person which is a subclass of something we might refer to as a creature. And Star Wars, for example, is a film series. So these are classes then here in blue that we have introduced. But is this already enough that we have to do? Can we deduce, for example, that Alec Guinness not only is a person, but also that since person is a subclass of creature, that Alec Guinness is a person. So here the dashed line. Can we deduce this in an automated way? With a traditional solution, yeah, of course. We can use this or solve this situation via individual software code. We can say if Alec Guinness is a person and person is a subclass of creature, then we introduce the triple Alec Guinness is a creature. But this of course only holds for that individual situation. This is not, uh, cannot be applied in an arbitrary way. Another thing, can we guess or deduce that Alec Guinness is different from Star Wars? Of course we can in exactly the same way we can here find out about that dashed line whether Star Wars is different from Alec Guinness. If we say, if Alec Guinness is a person and person is a subclass of creature and Star Wars is a film series and a film series is different from creature, so we have already here, creature is different from film series, then we can deduce that Star Wars is also different from Alec Guinness. Again, individual solution, individual software code. But again, if we look at that, we have to do it in the traditional way, which means the programmer has to do exactly the semantical processing. How can we or how can the computer know the meaning of the labels? For that, of course, we need or we would need some explicit knowledge representation because these kind of knowledge graphs that we so far have talked about exist already for a long time. Back in the 1980s here, there was the notion of so-called semantic networks and the semantic network there was defined as a net or a graph structure representing knowledge in patterns of interconnected nodes and arcs. Of course, this is not new. This is a thing that already exists almost 40 years ago. What's new would be then to include there also explicit knowledge representation. So, to represent knowledge explicitly and to make use of it, we need a knowledge representation that can be understood by the computer. And for that, we will refer to so-called ontologies, which are based on mathematical logic as a formal knowledge representation. And of course, then we are able not to be reliant only on so-called individual software solutions for doing a deduction or an inference. We can use a so-called inference engine or semantic reasoner. This is a piece of general software that is able to draw conclusions and inferences. But this only works if, of course, the knowledge we represent here is based on mathematical logic. Then we can, of course, use an inference engine for making general conclusions, as we've seen here, for example, to find out that Allegynes is a creature and also by finding out that Allegynes is different from Star Wars. So this can be done in a general way based on an inference engine. To make clear what it means is, 
So I can base, for example, I can use formal logic, and here I only use basic set theory as, of course, a small part of it, to uh, represent the knowledge that is represented here in my small knowledge graph. I can say that Obi-Wan Kenobi is an element of a class which is called fictional character. Alec Guinness here is an element of a class which is called person. Star Wars is an element of film series. Now I can say that a fictional character is a subclass of agent and person is a subclass of creature. And as a, as a final uh, constraint, I can say that film series, if I build, uh, if I, if I uh, draw or compute the intersection of film series and creature, the result will be the empty set, which means that both of these sets, um, film series and creatures, they are disjunctive. So if they are disjunctive, this means that no film series can be at the same time a creature and vice versa. If I have this knowledge represented, if, and then if I'm using a so-called logical reasoner, what I can find out immediately is that Alec Guinness is also a creature. Simply because Alec Guinness is a person and person is a subclass of creature, then we can deduce that Alec Guinness automatically is also a creature simply by the subclass definition. Because if a person is a subclass of creature, that means that every instance of the class person is at the same time an instance of the class creature by definition of subclass. And we can also deduce that Alec Guinness is not a film series, is different from film series, and Star Wars is not a creature. Simply by looking here at this uh, disjointness statement, that film series and creature, they have nothing in common, they are disjoint. And by that I can simply deduce that since Alec Guinness is a person and thereby also a creature, it cannot be a film series. And the same holds then for Star Wars. So this is the way how we can relate logics, and here only basic set theory is needed for, for these kind of, of uh, deductions that we do here, and a bit, of course, of first order logic. Um, thereby we can use a general program which is called a logical inferencer, um, which then can be used to draw these kind of conclusions and to really work uh, with the knowledge we have represented so far in the knowledge graph. And we might be able, based on that also, to define then classes in a more complex way, with more constraints, to put more knowledge into it so that the machine really is able to understand the stuff and so that we don't have in each and single way to individually encode everything with the processing power of the programmer's mind in the background. And this, of course, is what we mean by explicit knowledge representation and explicit semantics. And explicit semantics also is the thing that we will address then in the next lecture. But first of all, let's keep what's the difference between formal knowledge representation and traditional data structures. Number one, mathematical logic provides a framework for formally or to formally express the semantics of knowledge representation. So we need mathematical logic. Second, semantics of knowledge representation can be defined explicitly based on mathematical logic. And third, mathematical logic enables logical inferences and reasoning for knowledge representations, which is of course the main advantage over traditional data structures for which I have to implement this kind of reasoning always on an individual basis. And in the next lecture we will talk about the semantic web, which is of course then the realization of exactly that kind of concept of explicit knowledge representations within the realm of the World Wide Web.